Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. Ask Andrew anything. That's what this episode is. Hmm. What number is this episode? 190. 190. We do this every 10th? Correct. So this is the 19th time I've done this? Yes. <laughs> or 18th. I have to work on the math there. Well, maybe it should be ask Andrew almost anything. Mm -hmm. Then we'd keep the alliteration going, but we could reject questions that we don't like. Well, so far, we've been pretty good at we, meaning me, I've been pretty good at asking you questions that you've been willing to answer. So you haven't rejected much. No. <laughs> Although bovine flatulence, that one still remains in my mind as yes. something beyond my pay scale. <laughs> well, I do have a small stack of papers from our listeners that they've sent in with some questions for you. Okay. However, I'm not sure we're, we're going to get past the first one because it's such a big question that we get often. And it comes from Janelle, and I love her name because I have a sister, Janelle. Oh, uh, that's true. And I know for certain that Janelle is going to know this for certain, that she spells her name differently. There must be as many different ways to spell the name Janelle as there are Janelles. <laughs> Would you call that a spelling style, possibly? Possibly, <laughs> yes. So let me read you the question, and I just know that there are so many other listeners, both past present and future who will have this question. All right. Hello. I'm a faithful podcast listener. Love that. And our family has been using IEW since the beginning of our homeschool journey. Love that too. I appreciate all the wisdom you share. Thank you, Andrew, for the wisdom you share. <laughs> I just laugh. I have heard other writing instructors who adhere to a more free form style say that a formulaic approach to writing stifles the writer's voice. In this case, the child as they're learning to write. While I don't necessarily agree with them, I would love to hear your thoughts about developing the writer's voice. Well, that is a great question. I first came across the term voice as pertains to writing uh, probably back in 96 or 97. Mm when the Six Traits Writing Assessment Model mm -hmm. was created and promulgated by the Northwest Educational Regional Laboratories. Mm. Now, uh, I don't have a background in English or composition or creative writing. You know, I'm a musician. Right. And I kind of stumbled into this business of teaching structure and style. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I discovered this when a particular school district in Alaska said... Uh, our new state standards are based on the six traits. Do you know anything about this? <laughs> and I thought, if it could help me make a few dollars and gain a new customer, mm -hmm. I can learn. Right, <laughs> right. So I did, and I studied these six traits. So they generally are labeled as ideas and content, organization, word choice, sentence fluency, conventions, and then voice. Mm. And not always in that same order, sure. obviously, mm -hmm. uh, but those were the six traits. Now, mm -hmm. the original idea of the six traits, I think, was a good one, which is let's look at assessing children's writing using these different categories because a child might be, you know, strong, in one or two of them, but weak in another. And so it gives us a broader uh, assessment, a broader way to evaluate and help students move forward. But unfortunately, most schools and districts and states and teachers will end up teaching to the test. Mm. It's sure. unavoidable. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as you know that your children are going to be assessed according to this model, right, which is what it originally was, an assessment model, 
then they have to come up with an instruction model to match this. Right. So now here they are going into third grade classrooms in Alaska where the third grade benchmarks are going to assess these things and trying to help these little nine-year-olds have better ideas and better organization and better word choice and better sentence fluency and better conventions and better voice. And of all those six traits that you just, you know, spouted out, voice is the one that, like, what does that even mean? Right. And so here's the funny thing. My mother was a voice teacher. Oh, sure. Yeah. So when I heard the word voice, Mm -hmm. I immediately associated it with her teaching of voice. Mm -hmm. You know, she's a singing teacher. Mm -hmm. And what do singing students, what do vocal students do a whole lot of? Well, they listen to and mimic other singers. Well, and they also practice. Oh, yes, they do. (laughs) Right. Various exercises. I remember (laughs) being in my room Mm -hmm. after school, maybe working on my math homework or something. (laughs) And from the living room in my home were these voice lessons. And uh, the whole first part of it would be kind of this kind of thing. I'm doing, you know, not justice to it. I have no, but I wish our listeners voice. could see your face right now because it's really goofy. Um, so, so when I heard that term voice, I thought, well, a voice teacher exercises mm-hmm. the voice mm-hmm. by developing technique. Okay. Right. That's how my mother did it, and that makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. I did, however, go to a six traits teacher training one time just to see, you know, what what were people paying $200 for a six-hour seminar? Mm. It was like five times the cost of my seminar at the time. (laughs) And and what were they learning? Mm -hmm. And what I noticed is that this uh, presenter who had little or no classroom experience herself, was basically going through children's books and saying, isn't this great voice? Oh, here's another example of a great of great voice in a children's book. Well, here's another. Here's a different voice with the idea that if you just kind of read children's books to children, they would somehow by osmosis get this idea that Oh, you kind of be unique, be creative, be yourself, you know, do something different than other people. And I didn't detect one single concrete thing that I could have as a teacher taken back into the classroom as an exercise, as something specifically to do on paper with children to move them in that direction. Mm -hmm. So I think that problem of voice, it's very ephemeral. Now, if we look at great authors, right, they they have a voice, right? Hemingway has a voice, (laughs) a kind of terse, somewhat (laughs) melancholic voice, but it is a distinct voice. Charlotte Bronte Mm -hmm. has a different voice. Mm -hmm. Uh, Recently in a class with kids here, we read a story uh, by Herman Melville. Right. Melville has a voice. Mm-hmm. You look at books that are written for children, it's kind of a combination of imagery and wordplay, and you get things like the Bernstein Bears. Right. Right. And you've got this this uniqueness that is specific to, oh, that's a Bernstein Bears style. Right. So, well, and, and just right there, I love what you do with the students when you help them identify what that style is and then teach them to write according to the style of, say, Beatrix Potter. or yeah. Right. And that's so really fun. We, we've done a lot of work with that idea mm-hmm. of imitating a different author, mm-hmm. which is, of course, the opposite of what <laughs> creative writing teachers in universities tell their students, never imitate anyone. Right. But how can you not? Mm -hmm. How can you not? So in answering uh, Janelle's excellent question, and in part I think she's asking this question so that she has 
uh, an apologetic, you know, a defense yeah. of what she's doing with the IEW system right? Uh, for other people who might be a bit skeptical and say, oh, no, those models, those checklists, those are confining in a way. Mm-hmm. They're not going to allow the child's unique voice yes. to and, develop. And if you haven't used our system with a group of students, you might think that all of those things are carving little clones. That right. every student is going to write exactly the same way based on the checklist and based on what they're learning. And we know that is so not true. It is so not true. Um, you know, I'm thinking about uh, the group of younger students that we have right <laughs> now. And there are a few kids who have a very distinctive voice. But where does it really spring from? Well, there's two, two aspects, I would say. One, and most importantly, it springs from their imagination. Mm-hmm. So they can use the same checklist as everybody, mm-hmm. but they will inject their imagination, their personality, and not at all be hindered by the stylistic techniques that we require. <laughs> if, if anything, it's almost like fuel for their fire. <laughs> yes. um, and, and you show them how to do you know, a technique and then they want to try it this way and do it that way. And here's another weird example they can throw in. And You only have to underline one in a paragraph. But <laughs> yes. Boy, do they have 15 in that paragraph. <laughs> um, so I would say... The most important thing for the development of voice in children's writing is cultivating imagination. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that's done through literature and narration and storytelling and poetry Mm -hmm. and uh, exploration, all those really good and healthy things that used to be a much more kind of normal, organic part of childhood. Right. Go outside and play. And the imaginative games they would come up with then that you and I came up with while we were outside playing because our mothers wouldn't let us inside the house (laughs) (laughs) versus today where it's almost like these children, these kids have to be entertained. Well, and, you know, that's another topic for another day. Right. But uh, that would be my observation of the children I've worked with. And we're talking about, you know, thousands of children over the last 20 years that Mm -hmm. I have met, Mm -hmm. the ones who seem to have what you would assess as a unique voice have that because of a a active, engaged imagination and an opportunity to exercise Mm -hmm. that imagination through spoken and written language. Right. On the On the side of developing the repertoire, well, we we can pretty much know what makes good writing. Mm -hmm. Uh, The six traits assessment model is a pretty good list of things that Mm -hmm. would make good writing. Do, Do you need good ideas and content? Yes. Absolutely. Well, where does that come from? And, of course, that gets us back to, you know, the whole fundamental difference between most writing programs, Mm -hmm. and the way we start with the dictated content. So we give kids content and gradually teach them how to access content Mm -hmm. either externally from a source outside their own mind and imagination or internally, how Mm -hmm. to take notes from their brain. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we've talked again and again about how the nine units do this so beautifully. So their score, organization, well, that's probably our our super strong point. Right. You know, the six traits people were kind of trying to hope that kids would just naturally have a logical faculty that would cause them to organize in some nice way that wasn't formulaic. And if you're 7 or 17, that does not happen (laughs) organically. No, you need models. Mm -hmm. You need models. So that's what we have in the units is the organizational models, which Mm -hmm. then 
can be expanded or combined or adjusted for different purposes. But you got a right. you've got a foundational set of stuff mm-hmm. to work with. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, uh, word choice. You know, yes. we are super strong in this <laughs> yes. because children are limited to the words they know. Mm-hmm. So there's two things you've got to do. Give them more words to carry around in their brain, which is what they need for the standardized test, right. and give them a method of accessing more words that they can get into their brain, mm-hmm. right? So on one side, it's reading out loud, poetry, memorization, mm-hmm. Greek and Latin word roots, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. On the other side, it's word lists. Mm-hmm. Yep. And of course, most of our listeners know You know, we work with the strong verb, quality, adjective, L-Y, adverb, and we give children lists of words to choose from. Or help them create their own list. And create, exactly. Mm -hmm. And as the the word hops off the list through their brain and into their paper a few times, then it it stores in their brain. It moves from passive to active vocabulary. And then they can carry it around with them wherever they go. Mm -hmm. But children will be very limited in good word choice to the words they know. Right. So that's why vocabulary development is so mm-hmm. critical, and mm-hmm. we have such an emphasis on that. Yep. And then, of course, sentence fluency. Mm-hmm. Good heavens. I mean, that is, <laughs> of, of all the obvious but still secret weapons we have. Right. And you can just take a paragraph anyone wrote and see if they started most all the sentences with the subject. Right. Just start flipping them around a little bit, add in a prepositional opener here, reverse the order of a clause here, put an L-Y transition in there, and boom, the thing's better Right. With, without a whole lot of work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with the voice, what's interesting is we can teach these things that sound like voice to mm-hmm. objective readers. Right. Well, that would be our decorations. And our triples. When mm-hmm. you teach children to do a simile or metaphor, and then they come up with some crazy simile or metaphor. What was the one that the student came up with in class last week? Something about dancing on point. She turned, they turned like a dancer on point, I yeah. think. You know? Yeah. The, like The, the one I love was uh, Noah said uh, they were as distrustful. I think he was talking about their government. Mm -hmm. It was distrustful as you would be with a commission-based pay used car salesman. Yes, exactly. (laughs) What? What a lovely simile. (laughs) Uh, So, uh, you know, you teach that technique. You you teach the three very short sentences. That's Mm -hmm. a mechanical technique. Mm -hmm. But when it's done Mm -hmm. in writing – an objective assessor using six traits would say, well, that's a voice right. That's a voice thing right there. Right. You, know? uh, you teach uh, the use of alliteration mm-hmm. or assonance, mm-hmm. uh, triple patterns. Mm-hmm. These all come out as voice. Mm-hmm. And so when we put them on a checklist and say, practice these things, right. it's like, you know, my mother, a music teacher or someone teaching art mm-hmm. saying, practice these things so that you'll have tools right. for expressing yourself right. better when the time comes. Right. You know, I, I know you know this, but I learned this recently that Picasso was classically trained. Oh, yes. His art, before he went all cube on everyone, was so beautiful and so perfectly It was mo- photographically perfect. Yeah, he and- could draw like a picture. And that's why mm-hmm. people who try to be Picasso, they try to do something like Picasso did, but they don't have that foundation. Right. They can't be Picasso. Right. So Picasso certainly had his own voice in a visual art, but it started with a foundation of beauty. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, Janelle and all others who face this kind of skepticism mm-hmm. – um, It's perhaps Mm well-meaning, but ignorant. Uh, The people who are saying, don't stifle children with models, checklists, parameters, aren't really understanding the discipline of art Mm -hmm. that is based on technique and imitation and practice. And then you hit kind of a critical mass of, of that, and then you can make a leap Mm-hmm. a leap into voice. Right. And we can't predict or control 
at what age that's going to become more dominant. Right. Uh, we've got a couple little kids whose voice is very powerful in their writing. Right. Sometimes to a point of being borderline ridiculous, but that's because <laughs> they're 10 years old. Right. We've got some older teenagers who clearly have a distinctive kind of wry, subtle humor uh, voice in their writing. And then we've got some other kids who are still working just right. let me fit everything in, and yeah, mechanically it's good, it's solid. That's going to help them actually mm -hmm. in the real world of, say, college, university, business writing. I mean, not a lot of people get hired or are asked to write a paper that is terribly original and unique and voice sounding. I mean, right. it, that that whole idea exists more in the world of of fine arts. Writing as a, a fine art, writing right. as a, a creative author. thing, yeah. um, but but I don't see any conflict at all between being able to do both. Right, and Andrew, most of the writing that you and I do every day is responding to or writing emails, <laughs> and they had better be pretty clear, concise, compelling, and not too. And you know, I write stuff, and sometimes our editor sends it back, and she'll put a nice note like. I love the way you write. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure how I do. I mean, <laughs> if someone said, describe your writing, I don't think I could. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I have a particularly strong voice. But, um, you know, if anything, I hope to connect with my audience, yeah. meet the fundamental rule of rhetoric, know mm -hmm. your audience, be clear, be engaging. Right. And I think our, our system provides kids with the tools it's not even like I think. That's a dumb thing to say. I know <laughs> yes. only because now we have so many people, yes. you know, in their 20s or maybe even older. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. <laughs> that, you know, that grew up doing this mm -hmm. and are very successful in right. a myriad of different environments. Yep. yep. So, Love it. So I hope that answers Janelle's question. Do we have time for any more? Yes, I think we have time just for a couple more quick questions. All right. So this question comes from Christina, who is also a podcast listener. She says her daughter is infatuated with the Japanese culture, history, and language. Oh. Yeah. She's only 13 and is constantly stating her desire of studying abroad and living in Japan for at least a year. She has been studying Japanese as a self-directed endeavor with various books, curriculums, and online videos. What suggestions do you have for learning as you well know, such a complex language. And then also, what are your suggestions and thoughts about studying abroad as, well, a, as a high school student? Yeah, I am delighted to hear that. And I would say to her, you know, gambate kudasai, you know, do your best. <laughs> <laughs> we in the States would say, good luck. But in Japan, <laughs> they would say, work hard and do your best. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much to relish about the Japanese culture and tradition. Uh, obviously, you know, they've suffered in the postmodern era mm -hmm. as badly as we have or worse, mm -hmm. uh, the infection of technology. But the traditional Japanese culture is just so rich. I, I particularly enjoyed studying the language. And uh, one of the things I discovered immediately was really to, to get this language in my brain at all, I was going to have to learn to read it. Mm -hmm. So I started to try and recognize the characters. Right. And then I realized in order to consistently recognize characters, I needed to learn to write them. Oh, okay. And so I began a process of working through all of the uh, – there's, there's the two main alphabets is the hiragana and the katakana. And then, of course, all of the Chinese characters, kanji. And there's a – you know, there's basically a curriculum that every Japanese child starts with in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and it's mm -hmm. pretty well defined. And so I just started working through uh, learning to write the language, and that made all the difference. That made all the difference. Uh, the huge benefit you have of living in Japan is there's continuous opportunity to practice right. the language. <laughs> the difficult thing about learning it here is you don't often have chance to really have an exchange with a Japanese-speaking person. 
especially if that person lives here, they probably speak English. So it's really hard mm -hmm. to say, let's only speak Japanese to each other. But uh, one thing I did discover, and I talk about this in the Nurturing Competent Communicators talk, is I did discover that by memorizing uh, a big chunk of Japanese language, I was able to build into my my database of mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. um, additional vocabulary, but more importantly, phrases and clauses of correct syntax. Mm. And so I uh, tell the story of how I got Jack and the Beanstalk, Jaku Tomami no Ki, and I began to memorize this story. And it took me a long time, months, uh, but I did it. I memorized the whole story. And then in conversation, I would notice that a little phrase or clause or sentence would kind of hop out of Jack and the Beanstalk. Mm -hmm. I could change, you know, the nouns or verbs or mm -hmm. whatever I needed to change in that pattern to say what I wanted to say. And it was kind of a, a big breakthrough in fluency. Right. So if I were to undertake the learning of a foreign language again, particularly as an adult and particularly not in the environment where I had lots of opportunity, uh, I think I would try that. I would say, okay, give me uh, some stories, give me some poems, give me some children's books, and I will, you know, try to memorize those patterns. And then that, alongside with the study mm -hmm. of the grammar, the study of, you know, the the characters, the alphabets, right. the phonetics, if you will, um, that, that all uh, synthesize together, mm -hmm. right. I think, in the best possible way. Right. So I encourage her. And I, I wish every American student could have a chance, you know, sometime in late teens or early 20s mm -hmm. to live in a foreign country. Yep. Uh, it, it changes your view on so much right. about the world we live in and gives you, I think, a lot of empathy and perspective and wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Uh, go for it, girl. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try and sneak in one more. All right. And we better wrap it up. Okay, this comes from Jody. She says, hello, Andrew and Julie. I like that. I got included. Oh, you are famous. <laughs> People always tell me about Aww. how they like listening to you on the podcast. <laughs> so Jody says, I have an 11-year-old who I suspect may have some mild dyslexia. I have some books that I would like to read for the content, but they are above her reading level. I plan to get the books on audio so she can listen to them. Would it be beneficial to have her read along with a printed copy of the book? Um, it may or may not. Mm -hmm. It can't hurt to try. Mm -hmm. It might be very frustrating to try and force that right? because the audiobook could be going faster than her decoding skills. She could get lost on the page and then feel somehow like a failure mm -hmm. if she wasn't keeping up. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that if you try it, you might attempt to get a larger print edition right. of that book because for kids who have a mild dyslexia, just increasing the print size can really help mm -hmm. a lot. Um, if it is a a classic that's in the public domain, you may be able to get a copy online at gutenberg.org mm -hmm. and then you could actually print it in a larger font. Might take some time to, you know, tweak it around, make it look good. Um, that would also give her the freedom to kind of write in it so mm -hmm. she could mark where she was on the page. Right. Uh, it is very easy for children, even not dyslexic children, to get lost in a page full of text. Yep. So I would say it can't hurt to try, but I if, if it's not going well, just drop it. Don't force it. Let her enjoy those books. Mm. You know, let her enjoy them as, as audio books and, uh, you know, being read to out loud. I hope that Jody has listened to my talk on nurturing competent communicators. I think she would, uh, if she hasn't heard that, Yep. She would benefit greatly. 
So lots of links in our show notes based on the content of today's episode. Your article on six traits in IEW. Yep. Um, nurturing competent communicators. And there's one, uh, Thoughts on Dyslexia. The Thoughts on Dyslexia. Yeah, that one could be good, That's too. Good in article. fact, the whole book, really, however imperfectly, mm-hmm. full of all the articles I've written for 20 years. Yeah, that, yeah. that's a great resource. And and if you're a premium member, you can get it free. Little plug in there. Oh. Otherwise, if not, you can buy it for $25, and it's a tremendous resource. So, Well, thank you, Andrew. This time I always goes so quickly when we're doing an Ask Andrew Anything. Well, we'll do it again in 10 episodes. 10 episodes, okay. Good, thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Poudois and the team at IEW, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking. Thank you.